Hello and welcome to our primer on how to use the Sortor Prover for automated formal verification of your smart contracts. In this video, we will teach you how to download, install, and do your first few steps in using the Sortor Prover. At first, we will remind you what formal verification means. The Sartora Prover takes two different inputs. One of them is the code of your smart contract. The other is a specification file that includes the invariants or properties that you want to prove that your code adheres to. Then the Sartora Prover gives you one out of three possible outcomes. One, it produces a mathematical proof that uh, the code always holds the invariants or properties. The second is a scenario where the code does not hold uh, the specified invariants. And in the third option, the tool just couldn't find an answer in a timely manner. Before installing the Sertora Prover, you must be sure that you have the following installed in your system. The first, you must have a Python version of 3.816 or newer, and also have a Java development kit version 11 or newer. And finally, you must also have the Solidity compiler installed on your machine that is able to compile your smart contract code. To install the Sertora Prover, please open your terminal and execute pip install sertora-cli. And to verify that the installation was successful, we will execute Sertora run dash dash version to see that uh, the system could locate the correct installation of Sertora Prover. To show you how to run the Sertora Prover on some smart contract together with its specification, we will first download an example from this public repository called Sertora init inside Sertora. So we will copy the URL in order to clone the repository. Go back to your terminal and copy the repository link. Before we are able to run the prover for the first time, be sure that you already have the environment variable Sertora key, all capitals, no spaces, set with your own personal key. If you don't already have a key, you can get one for free in the Sertora.com website if you go to sign up. And now we will enter the newly cloned repository Sertora init. And we will run the prover with the command Sertora run. We will supply it with a prover configuration file. And inside this repository, it's in the Sertora directory inside the conf directory and it's called default.conf and now we will execute it and we will see some output on the screen we can see that the smart contracts have been compiled and the job was sent to the Sotora server here we can see that we can follow our job at this link to the Sotora prover dashboard so we will copy it and enter it we will now go to the dashboard in our browser. In order to monitor our prover jobs, we'll first need to log in using our Sertora key. Once we do that, we click login. And here we can see that our job started to run. Before that, the status was uploading. And we can see all types of data about the job that we have just sent. We can see the job ID, which is unique to this specific verification job that we have sent to the cloud. We can see what was the name of the main contract. 
we can see that this job has a specific message which we can edit. We can edit it to say first test. We can see the time at which the job was started. We can add tags to our job. For example, we can say it's a test. And we can see the prover version that we've used. We can also mark this run as a favorite or archive it. And now we see that the job was already executed. And now we can look inside the verification report of our recent job by clicking on the link under job ID. And we can notice several things here inside this report. The first is the status of the run. It is executed, meaning that it has been executed successfully without any tool problems or failures. Below that, we can see the name of the smart contract that we have formerly verified, in our case, ERC20. And below it, we can see a list of all the different properties or rules that we have mathematically verified for the ERC20 contract. For example, we have a rule called breachability or a rule called transfer spec. We can also delve deeper. For example, the rule only holder can change allowance has been verified for each and every function inside the ERC20 smart contract. For example, it has been proven mathematically true for the function decimals or allowance or mint and so on. Now let's take a look at the input files that we gave to the prover. Inside the Sertora init directory, there is a contracts directory which includes all the Solidity files of the smart contract that we have verified. In particular, we tried to verify the properties on the erc20.sol file. If we open it, we see it's part of the open source Open Zeppelin libraries, and this is version 4.4.1 of this contract. I will assume in this video that you are familiar with ERC20 tokens and know how they operate. In particular, this token can be minted, burned, transferred, and has an allowance. Inside the Sertora directory, inside the spec directory, we have the ERC20.spec file, which was the specification file that we used to verify the smart contract. It is written in CVL, short for Sertora Verification Language. CVL was designed to allow expressive specification of properties and also to resemble Solidity in syntax. If we look at the anatomy of this file, we see that at first we have this methods block, which lets us convey additional information about functions of the smart contract that we are verifying. And after that, we can see that the first part includes some basic rules or properties of the ERC20 smart contract. Each rule has some written explanation as a comment right above it, and each rule corresponds to a specific property that we're trying to prove. In our case, the property that we will focus on is called transfer doesn't revert. This rule checks that if all the conditions are correct and all the parameters transferred to the transfer function are correct, then it should not revert. This, for example, checks that no denial of service attack on the transfer function is possible. 
Let's look into it. At line 72, we're defining three different variables. This is different from variable definition in programming languages because we do not assign to these variables one concrete value. Instead, they have an arbitrary value. For example, the variable recipient is of type address, but it's not, it doesn't have the value zero. It's not the address zero. It's not address 100. And it's also not necessarily the address of this smart contract that we are verifying. However, it can get any value that can cause a counterexample. So it's unconstrained. Recipient is the address that we're transferring the tokens to. And amount is the amount of tokens that we want to transfer to it. The variable E is of type env, short for environment. And it holds some additional information about this transaction. In our case, we use it to see who was the sender of this message. We do it by, let's look at line 74, using e.msg.sender. Lines 74 to 78 are a series of five required statements. We use those to tell the prover to ignore certain scenarios and conditions. As we said before, if we don't do that, all the variables can have an arbitrary state, including some that are unfeasible or are interesting. In our case, let's look at these required statements. At line 74, we check that the sender of the transfer has enough tokens to transfer. At line 75, we check that uh, no message value was, was passed to this function call. At line 76, we check that the balance of the recipient would not overflow as a result of getting some amount of tokens, which is an unreasonable situation in reality, but the prover doesn't know that and it needs to have this constraint because otherwise it would consider this as a valid counterexample, which is of no interest to us. Lines 77 and 78 check that both addresses of the sender and the recipient are not the zero address. At line 80, we finally invoke the transfer method and we allow it to revert with the syntax at with revert. And we pass to it all the required parameters, including the environment variable. And finally, at line 81, we have our test. We are asserting that the last call to the transfer function did not revert. Now let's see what happens when we introduce a bug inside the Solidity file. If we go to the ERC20 Solidity file, we will introduce a bug in the transfer function. For example, we will change the requirement that the sender balance has to be strictly larger than the amount that we're trying to transfer. And now we will try to run this buggy contract together with the specification file. Since we are running the same contract with the same specification file, we can reuse the same configuration file as we did before. Go back to your terminal and execute the exact same command as before. After it is sent, we'll check it inside the dashboard. After it would finish running, the dashboard would have another line that looks like this. And again, we'll click on the link inside the job ID to see the rule report. 
Unlike last time, now we see that one of the rules does not have a green check mark. It is violated. Let's delve deeper and see why it was violated, meaning the prover could not prove it mathematically. So here we have a cold trace, which resembles what a cold trace would look like in a debugger. And on the right side, we have some values of different variables. For example, we have the environment variables like the block number, timestamp, the address of the recipient of the transfer, which we've defined inside the specification file, the amount of tokens that were sent, which was 12, the sender, message sender, which is 8,000 hexadecimal, and uh, lots of other data, which is not very interesting. And we have the address of the ERC20 contract, which is this address. So let's look inside the call trace. Here we start from the global state. Global state is the initial state of this test which, as we recall, is arbitrary, but in this specific counterexample, it has some concrete values. For example, this is the ETH balance of the 8000 address. And this is the ETH balance of the ERC20 address, which are not very interesting in our case. Then we have a series of requirements, as we wrote in the spec file. The first requirement was that the balance, the ERC20 balance of, of uh, e-message sender was greater than or equal to amount. And we see that it is successful. The ERC20 balance was exactly 12. And it is greater than or equal to amount, which was 12. So we see that in this counterexample, the amount is exactly equal to uh, the ERC-20 balance, which is exactly the bug we've inserted. If we want to look further, we can see that all the other requirements were met, were true. However, the transfer was reverted. If we delve deeper, we see that transfer include an internal call to underscore transfer, which itself reverted. So this assertion is wrong because last reverted was true. And it did, it found the bug that we've inserted. The next steps. If you didn't yet get a Sortora key, you can get a free key with a renewable amount of monthly minutes of execution at Sortora.com. You can read the detailed documentation of the Sertora Prover at docs.sertora.com. Or if you prefer to learn by example, you should try our Prover tutorial at github.com slash Sertora slash tutorials. Thanks for watching and good luck finding bugs.